everyone. What a beautiful day to be in the house of Yahweh, right? What a glorious service we had, the worship service. Thanks for those that lead out and to bring certain songs and things that uh, really touch the heart. It's interesting that uh, <clears throat> those scripture, those uh, songs that he selected there uh, is very much the tied in with our Torah portion today. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to uh, make comment on was the, uh, the Shema. We uh, watched again the, uh, the movie on the book of Daniel last night. And <clears throat> it's pretty interesting that uh, when uh, they were fixing to push Daniel into the lion's den, uh, what he said was the Shema. And us that know what the Shema was or is, we recognized it, but 99% of the other people would have not known what, what he was saying. Because <clears throat> if you remember the reason he got thrown in to the lion's den was that he refused to stop praying to Jehovah and that only to pray to the king and his gods and uh, so <clears throat> he told him that uh, uh, that there was only one God. That's really what the Shema is about. There's only one God, the God of creation that created the, the world and created each one of us. So I <clears throat> just thought I'd mention that. If you get a chance to watch it, it's a very good movie. It's, I think, pretty close to being 100% accurate. It's really close. And uh, this gives you some insights. Maybe, <clears throat> you know, we... We read these stories, and they were just stories, but we, but when we make a connection with that uh, individual, then uh, it has more meaning, I uh, think, to us. Yeah. So, <clears throat> wanted to open with a, with a Psalms this morning. <clears throat> As our worship was about praise and uh, asking for interventions and these types of things. This is in uh, Psalm 66. It says, Make a joyful noise unto Jehovah, all you lands. Interesting that he used the word lands there. You know, we there was several times it was said that, uh, that uh, your praises inhabit Israel, the, you know, the people of Israel says the land, and we know that eventually that will take place, as we talked about there. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praises glorious. Say unto Jehovah, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All of every knee will bow, every knee will, tongue will confess. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Shalah. Shalah means make it so, let it be. Come and see the works of Jehovah. He is terrible in his doings towards the children of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on, no, on foot. There did we rejoice in him. He ruled by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Selah. Oh, bless our Elohim, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth our soul in life, and suffereth not our feet to be moved. For thou, O Jehovah, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou broughtest into the net. Thou laidest afflictions upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but thou broughtest out into a wealthy place. I will go into <clears throat> thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. 
I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings with the incense of rams, and I will offer bullocks with goats. Shalai. Come and hear, all ye that fear Jehovah, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I, <clears throat> I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, Jehovah will not hear me. Wow. But verily, Jehovah hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Bless me, Jehovah, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Amen. Amen. Well, it's wonderful to realize who our God is, what he has done, and what he continues to do, and the hope that he has for all mankind. Said he didn't want to see anyone lost. <clears throat> so we're going to look at some things in our Torah portion today. Beha Aloch. And I'm sure that's not close to the way it's pronounced, but that's, that's close. It's in, uh, we're going to, of course, it starts in the first part of Numbers 8, I believe it is, 8-1. But uh, there is a wealth of uh, things to talk about in this Torah portion. But uh, I, for whatever reason, and it seems to be the subject this morning, we're going to look at Numbers 11. Numbers 11, 1. <clears throat> says, And when the people complained, it displeased Yahweh. And Yahweh heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of Yahweh burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto Yahweh, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of that place Tabar, because the fire of Yahweh burnt among them. Going on in the mit and the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this old manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed and the color thereof as a color of bedlam. Bedlam is a beautiful thing. It's a natural gem. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in meals or beat it into mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families. Every man in the door of his tent and the anger of Yahweh was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto Yahweh, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? Wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all of this people on me? So we kind of got everybody kind of complaining. Well, you know, the whole deal of this manna, of course, is in Exodus the manna was really a test to show them that he is the provider of all things. Because he told them that on the sixth day that there would be a double portion that they could go out and gather where they didn't have to work on the seventh day of the Shabbat. Their food would be there. But during the week, they only deliver, uh, ate and uh, gathered enough for that day's meals. So it was a test. And what happened? Some failed the test. They went out on the Shabbat. Looking for it. 
because they had failed to prepare the day before and to get enough, and it wasn't there. So he was not only testing, but he was trying to train them about not only the Shabbat, but that I will provide for you. You don't have to worry about working on the Shabbat. You don't have to worry about going out and doing all these things. I will provide for you. So, so then it became such a mundane thing for 40 years, and they got tired of eating the same stuff all the time. So we got to have a little variety here. We got to have, remember all that stuff back in Egypt that we ate freely? I don't think it was freely that they ate of it because <clears throat> their provisions was being provided by the king as they worked on his stuff, right? So <clears throat> as we go on in Numbers 11, says, have I conceived all of this people? This is Moses. He says, have I begotten them that thou should say unto me, carry them in the bosom as a nursing father bears a suckling child unto the land which thou swore unto their fathers? And after all, they hadn't been in the wilderness very long, only about two years. When should I have flesh? Where am I going to get flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I'm not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me. I pray thee out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see thy evil. Can you imagine being in Moses' shoes? How exasperating that would be that every day you had to deal with people complaining and griping and having to settle quarrels and these types of things going in numbers eleven sixteen, it says and you always said unto Moses gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them into the, unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon you, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. You know, these were the same words that <clears throat> was spoken at, at the uh, Last Supper, that he gave a measure of the Spirit upon the disciples there because he knew what was coming because he told them, he says, from now you go into all the world teaching the gospel to all nations, kindred tongues, and people. So he says, you're going to need a little bit more. You've been in this three-year period of learning. Now it's to put that learning to work, put it to the, to the test, Go out there, and you're going to need a spirit because you're going to run against a lot of people that's going to kill you or want to kill you, a lot of people that say, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> so you're going to need this spirit working, dwelling within. Yep. What about today? Do we need that spirit working within us? Oh, yeah. Most definitely, because we cannot do it on our own. He called us to just to be the bearers of the light where we can and the truths plant the seed, but it, it, the Holy Spirit would do the watering and bring the harvest about. Yeah. So, Moses, in his exasperation, asked the Father, he said, man, I need some help. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever got that point in your life that you ask God for help. Yeah. I know you have maybe went to your boss and said, man, you, you got me working 14 hours a day, and I need some help. Can you hire somebody? Uh -huh. Yeah. Basically the same thing, Moses, he says, you know, I, I need help. <clears throat> <clears throat> says, he put it upon them that they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And say thou unto the people, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and you shall eat flesh, for you have wept in the ears of Yahweh, saying, who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore Yahweh said, will give you flesh, and you shall eat. 
You shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days. But even a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that you have despised Yahweh, which is among you. Wow. Now we're getting to the root of the matter here. And have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? And Moses said, The people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. So we know that there's well over a million people out here in the wilderness. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. It's going to have to kill the whole cow, give cow to every, every person, right? Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the flesh of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? And Yahweh said unto Moses, Is Yahweh's hand wax short? I can do that, he says. I can do that. Look at an eye. Just like that lawyer you see on TV. I can get you millions just like that. Probably seen that one a time or two. You had a truck accident? Call me. I can get you money just like that. <laughs> no, you better call on your father. He can get it faster than that. <clears throat> Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And Moses went out and told the people the words of Yahweh and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And Yahweh came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and he gave it unto the 70 elders and it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them they prophesied and they did not again they prophesied well you know there's a couple of different ways of understanding prophes prophesying Prophesying, for one, can be just reading the Word, reading and studying the Word. That's prophesying. But then there's others that prophesy the things to come. Going on in Numbers 11, it says, And Moses get him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel, and there went forth a wind from Yahweh. And brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side. And as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp. And as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. Most, most people think or figure that a cubit is the length from your elbow to the end of your hand. And if that's so, that's almost four foot if you tell two of them. They're at least three foot. And the people stood up all day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered the quail. Didn't even sleep. He that gathered least gathered ten homers and they spread them all abroad, abroad for themselves round about the camp. I guess they were drying them. Dressing them. And then they began to eat. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of Yahweh was kindled against the people. And Yahweh smote the people with a very great plague. You ever had food poisoning? <laughs> That's pretty nasty if you've ever had it. This might even be worse than food poisoning. And he called the name of that place. If you can pronounce that word, I'll give you a... Uh, an A and a whatever. The meaning of it's graves of the longing. So it not only made them sick, but they died. Because there they buried the people that lusted. So why am I reading all this? What has that got to do with us? 
Well, our, to start, we, we were talking about praising the Father and thanking him for the manifold blessings that he bestowed upon our life each day. Sometimes we get so accustomed to waking up in the morning and, you know, going about our business and uh, never even thanking him for a good night's rest or even a bed to sleep in or a house to cover your head, a meal on a table. So let's look and see if there's a life lesson that we can get out of, out of this story. It says, how in the world could a group of people who had just been freed after years of slavery, been shown miracle after miracle, and have every one of their needs provided for, still somehow manage to complain about nothing? The answer lies in the extraordinary way in which Yahweh designed us. This may be a little bit different way to look at it. When it comes to our daily thoughts, which are the precursors to all of our actions, Yahweh wired us in a fascinating way. Our minds easily and naturally focus on what we're lacking. This bears repeating. Our minds will easily and naturally focus on what we do not have. It takes actual effort for us to think about the blessings of what we do have. Uh -huh. And you find that, I find that even with my, myself. You know, you think, well, well, I need this, or I need that, and what about this, and what about that, and, you know. Come on. Our minds can be likened to a garden. The soil will bring forth most anything that you want to plant in it. But if you don't plant anything, you won't have any crops, but you will have weeds growing instead. You don't even have to plant them. Without the seeds, the land doesn't just remain barren. Weeds will grow in abundance. This analogy is a true gateway to understanding why most people walk around unhappy and with absolutely no zeal for life. Ah, come on. Unless you make a conscious decision to focus on something positive, then by default, your mind will simply and easily drift towards negative and unproductive thoughts. Come on. Ever, ever experienced that? I think we all have. You know, it's the same old story throughout Scripture where it talks about even the man that the, had these uh, evil spirits within, and he, they got him out, but he didn't put anything in. And what happened? Seven times more evil spirits came in. Those weeds began to grow because he didn't, plant something in there that would keep those uh, weeds out. Unless you make a conscious decision to focus on something positive, then by default your mind will simply and easily drift towards the negative. I have found that within my own self. We, we get to start thinking about all the world and the things that are going around us. And it's all this negativity that, that surrounds us, mm -hmm. and it becomes, we speak it. We speak ne negative things. And one negative thought leads another negative thought, and pretty soon you're way out here in left field someplace. Uh -huh. The people have been given everything from Jehovah, their lives, their freedom, and all their physical needs were provided for with little or no effort. But instead of being overjoyed beyond belief by focusing on <clears throat> what they now had, the Israelites allowed their minds to remain barren, whereby they naturally complained about all the things they didn't have because they didn't focus on what they had. Jehovah knew that there was no way he could ever make them happy, 
and the wrath of God flared greatly. There's no amount of blessings that could ever make someone happy. But we find we're living in a world that's a gimme gimme. I'm, I'm, that'll make me happy if, if I go out and buy a new car. If I, if I do this or do that, I'm going to be happy. If we're depending on those things to make you happy, you're going to be discouraged all the time. Yep. Because even if you have the ability to, re, to get that that you think is going to make you happy, it's not. <laughs> it, might, it might for a few days, you know. If he chooses to not think about them, someone says there is no amount of blessings that could ever make someone happy if he chooses to not think about them, the blessings. Everything Jehovah gave them made them ecstatic for a day, and then their focus switched from elation to what's now lacking. Now, well, that was yesterday. Their entire well-being and attitude diametrically changed as soon as their focus changed and this is the powerful life-changing lesson for all of us for a life of peace and blessedness it's absolutely mandatory to take time each and every day to really and truly think about the blessing God showers on you yes. remember a lack of appreciation and awareness is the first step towards unhappiness so, so that's, like I say, we're not immune to it, but it's something that we have to think about, something that we have to focus upon, something that you have to do. Because negativity is around us. We need to surround ourselves with positive thoughts, positive action, because God is positive. I've never seen in my Bible a negative word from God. Everything is positive. Everything, do this and you'll live. Yeah. Do this and I'll give you life. Do this and I'll bless you. Those are positive things that we can do. It says, take the time to really thank the one who gives and gives and stop focusing on the things that at this moment you don't have. Uh-huh. Fill your mental garden with only the right kinds of thoughts and watch in amazement how you have more and more to be thankful for. You know, sometimes we begin to worry about things in the world and even worry about the weather and worry about this and where am I going to get my next meal or maybe uh, I need to worry about something that might happen. You know, worry and, and it's if when you boil it down, worry is lack of faith. When you really boil it down to the nitty gritty. Not to be presumptuous, but to have faith in Jehovah that he will accomplish the, those things for you and with you if you give him the opportunity and give him the power to do that. Because he doesn't have any really power uh, over you and, unless you give him that power. Yeah. Okay? If we just say, oh, I got this guy, don't worry about it. He said, oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Do what you got to do. Yep. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> if we, that's truly turning our life over to him. That's truly allowing the mind of Yeshua being us. When we do that, we give him the power and the control over us and the things that, that we're involved in. They may not always work out to think it the way that you think it should, but then in the essence of it, like Jeff was saying, he tries us, you know. He doesn't abandon you, but he tries you, and sometimes you get scratching your head going like, what is going on? So those, those tests are there to strengthen our faith in that Jehovah knows what he's doing and knows what's going on and what's going to happen. So we're going to read a few scriptures here. 
that will hopefully uh, give us life, give us a positive outlook on life. Philippians 4, 4, 6, rejoice in Yahweh always, and again I say rejoice. Do we rejoice? Yes. Sometimes we have a hard time being joyful, aren't we? It? When we think that all around us the world's going to hell in a handbasket and whatever else is going on, how can I be joyful, God? Let your moderation be known unto all men. The sovereign is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto Elohim. Yeah. Thought it was good, Rodney pointed out the answer me, answer me. That that was a request and not a demand. Right. Sometimes we, in a roundabout way, demand that he do this and this and this, you know. You know, after all, we're your people. You know, and after all, we're, we're walking in your pathways. So you you got to do this. No, it don't always work that way. It says, And the peace of Elohim which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through the Messiah Yeshua. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, Think on these things. That's the positive side of this whole thing. You know, we can say, well, man, this world is terrible. This passed this law this day, and they're putting this law in, and these people are doing this and that and the other, you know. But in the end, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. <clears throat> these... Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the Elohim of peace shall be with you. Not that I speak in respect of, of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith be content. Yeah. Wow, that is one big word, content. Be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through the Messiah which strengthens me. But my Elohim shall supply all your need according to his riches and dignity by the Messiah Yeshua. Now unto Elohim and our Father be praised forever and ever. Luke 3, 7. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized in him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? It says, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. And begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you, that Elohim is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Yep. And he's talking about us also. Just because you follow the Torah, follow you do this and that and the other, you don't have some exalted spot. Nope. You still need fruits worthy of repentance. That's right. You still need to praise him. And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Mm -hmm. Now I was talking about that movie that we watched with Daniel. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? What was the dream that he had? He had this tree, this tree that was a huge tree that went all the way into heaven and covered the sky. And he said, then he dreamed that some this angel or somebody from heaven come and cut that tree down and put an iron band around the root where it wouldn't grow. And Daniel says, that's you. Because of what? Your pride? 
you're not giving praise to the Father, not recognize him as the God of, and the creator, he says, I'm going to cut you down, your, your nation, basically, and make you walk around out in the pasture like an animal for seven years. So how important is it to praise the Father for the things that he provides for us every day, the very life that we have, not to be haughty or high-minded or prideful. Well, you know, I know more than you do. It says right here, you know. That's kind of getting prideful, isn't it? And the people ask him, saying, What shall we do then? And he answered and said unto them, He that hath two coats, let us impart to him that has none. And he that hath food, let him do likewise. So it's like that command that he wrote way back in the Old Testament, but everybody only thinks that it was written in the New Testament to create to treat your neighbor as yourself. That's the, that's the premises of that there is to t uh, treat your neighbor as yourself, those that you run into that needs help. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than thou which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accursed any falsely, and be content with your wages. Wow. Content with your wages. Exact no more than that which is appointed to you. And going on in Luke, John answered and said unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of those whose shoes I have not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff shall he will burn with fire unquenchable. You think maybe this was a representation of what had taken place there. Because that fire burned unquenchable. He gathered the wheat into his barn. He will purge the floor. Throughout Scripture, it's always talking about a harvest. It's always about harvest of people, of souls. Hebrews 13 says, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Let your manner of life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, Yahweh is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You know, that was the very thing that was pointed out in this, in this about Daniel. Because even the king... He understood that he got bilked into this whole idea of putting people to death because that they didn't they weren't praying to his God. And he sought every way to be able to turn over his edict that he had put his seal on to. And even Daniel told him, says, You can't do that because you're a king. And in the king's law, his his decrees are law, they cannot be changed. Even the king cannot be cha can change it. So just give the character of, of what we need to be. Because <clears throat> he told him, he says, whatever it be, you know, God's basically in charge. So that we bo boldly say, Yahweh is our helper. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of Elohim whose faith follow, considering the end of their manner of life. 
He'll show the Messiah the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Man, there's a whole mouthful right there. Just turn on your computer. If you want some diversity and some strange doctrines, whatever, they're there for the picking. He says, but don't be carried about with these things. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. He's not talking only about the grace this way, but the grace this way. The grace that we give to each other. <clears throat> we have an altar, wherefore they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Yeshua also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifices of praise to Elohim continually, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Wow. It says, go forth, therefore, without the camp, bearing his reproach. Not only do we want to bring the light into his people, but we want to bring the light into the world. Minister without the camp. His love and his sacrifice, always with the lips, fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. 1 Timothy 6 says, But holiness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. What a truer statement. If you've ever been to a funeral, the old saying is, never seen a hearse with a luggage rack on it. So be content, but with holiness be content. And having food and raiment, let us be therefore with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. If you're always chasing the almighty dollar, the end is not good says the love of money it's not the money it's the love of it what you're going to do with it God gives you the opportunity to have those ability to help others it says charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living Yahweh who giveth us richly all things to enjoy that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to do, distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold upon everlasting life. That's what we need to be chasing after, everlasting life. Oscar Wilde famously said, there are two problems with life. Sometimes you don't get what you want, and sometimes you do. And that can be a problem. The most unhappy people are the ones that got what they wanted in life. The other people are unhappy too, just not as bad, because they think that there's a reason that they are unhappy. The ones who got what they wanted don't know why it isn't helping. Some people need to get what they want to realize it won't make them happy and some people are willing to think if you thought that something tomorrow was going to solve all your problems and thinking that would make you happy now it means that your mind controls your happiness now and that thing won't do you any good because it isn't making you happy your thinking is therefore you can have the best life possible if you are willing to think 
there's many things that we can add to that. Think before you speak. You know, count the cost is what the scripture says. Count the cost before you do that. I thought it was good about these two problems in life. I was at the uh, uh, chiropractor this week. He has this big uh, picture on the wall, and it says, um, if all the medicines in the world was dumped into the ocean, it would be bad for the fish, but, but good for mankind. And that was a, a doctor, which is a professor in Harvard that wrote that. So I thought it was pretty, pretty eye-opening to a certain extent. It says, complaining is almost always non-specific. We are looking for something to complain about. And when we find it, if you want to complain, you will. We can stay at the best five-star hotel and, and then complain about the concierge stopped smiling for a moment, or the tea was a touch too strong or too weak, or the carpet was too soft. There is no such thing as perfection. That's something that I learned a long time ago. If we're looking for perfection in this world, you will not find it. There is no perfection. And I'm reminded of that in, even in our business. Because even though the, we try to buy and, and have built and provide the, the best housing that we can for people, it's not perfect. But we sometimes people got this thing about, well, you know, we paid fifty thousand dollars for that, and it needs to be perfect. Nothing that man builds is perfect. The only thing that God creates is perfect. <clears throat> so, if we are looking, we will always find the flaw. Even though the person complaining thinks precisely the opposite, complaining has nothing to do with circumstances and everything to do with attitude. If our attitude is bad enough, we will even complain about manna coming down from heaven and tasting like something that we really don't want. But why do we complain? The problem is with expectations. The higher our expectations, the more upset we feel when life doesn't live up to them. The less we expect, the more likely we are to see the good in whatsoever comes our way. I would venture to say that expectations will never contribute to our happiness. They will only ever undermine it. Expect perfection and life will always disappoint you. Expect very little and life will always surprise you. Life and all that is within it is a blessing that God has bestowed upon us. Unmerited and undeserved. Seeing in that way will fill us with gratitude and grant us immunity from complaining. So in the end, we say don't complain. Just relax and count your blessings and Shabbat on. There you go. Thank you for watching a teaching from Amet HaTorah. If you are ever in the Odessa area, we would love to welcome you to our Shabbat service, 11 a.m. every Sabbath. For more information or for more teachings, feel free to find us on the web, www.amethatoraodessa.com. Also, you can find us on Facebook. Thank you. God bless you and your family. Shalom.